The Tunnel by Sarah Ellis When I was a kid and imagined myself older, with a summer job, I thought about being outdoors. Tree planting, maybe. Camping out, getting away from the parents, coming home after two months with biceps of iron and bags of money. I used to imagine myself rappelling down some mountain with a geological hammer tucked into my belt. At the very worst, I saw myself sitting on one of those tall lifeguard chairs with zinc ointment on my lips. I didn't know that by the time I was 16 it would be the global economy and there would be no summer jobs, even though you did your life skills analysis as recommended by the guidance counselor at school. Motivated, energetic, computer literate, shows initiative, workplace appropriate hair. What I never imagined was that by the time I got to be 16, the only job you could get would be babysitting. I sometimes take care of my cousin Lawrence. Lawrence likes impersonating trucks and being held upside down. I am good at assisting during these activities. This evidently counts as work-related experience. Girls are different. Elizabeth, who calls herself Ivy, is six and one quarter years old. I go over to her place at 7.30 in the morning and I finish at one o'clock. Then her dad or her mom or her gran, who is not really her gran but the mother of her dad's ex-wife, takes over. Ivy has a complicated family. She doesn't seem to mind. Ivy has a yellow plastic suitcase. In the suitcase are Barbies. Ivy would like to play with Barbies for five and one half hours every day. In my babysitting course at the community center, they taught us about first aid, diapering, nutritious snacks, and how to jump your jollies out. They did not teach Barbies. You be Wanda, says Ivy, handing me a nude Barbie who looks as though she is having a bad hair day. I'm quite prepared to be Wanda if that's what the job requires. But once I am Wanda, I don't know what the heck to do. Ivy is busy dressing Francine, Loris, Betty, and Talking Doll, who is not a Barbie at all, but a baby doll twice the size of the Barbies. What should I do, I ask? Ivy gives me the look, an unblinking stare that combines impatience, scorn, and pity. Play, she says. When you have 16-year-old guy hands, there is no way to hold a nude Barbie without violating her personal space. But all her clothes seem to be made of extremely form-fitting, stretchy neon stuff. And I can't get her rigid arms with their pokey fingers into the sleeves. Playing with Barbies makes all other activities look good. The study of irregular French verbs, for example, starts to seem attractive. The board game Candyland, a favorite of Lauren's and previously condemned by me as a sure method of turning the human brain into tofu, starts to seem like a laugh riot. I look at my watch. It is 8.15. The morning stretches ahead of me. Six weeks stretch ahead of me. My life stretches ahead of me. My brain is edging dangerously close to the idea of eternity. I hold Wanda by her hard, claw-like plastic hand and think of things that Lawrence likes to do. We could notch the edge of yogurt lids to make deadly star-shaped Tonky for a ninja attack, but somehow I don't think that's going to cut it with Ivy. She's probably not going to go for a burping contest either. A warm breeze blows in the window, a small wind that probably originated at sea and blew across the beach, across all those glistening, slowly browning bodies, before it ended up here, trapped in Barbie world. I'm hallucinating the smell of suntan oil. I need to get outside. I do not suggest a walk. I know, from Lawrence, that walk is a four-letter word to six-year-olds. Six-year-olds can run around for 72 hours straight, but half a block of walking and they suffer from life-threatening exhaustion. I therefore avoid the W word. Ibi, would you like to go on an exploration mission? Ibi thinks for a moment. Yes. We pack up the Barbies. It's quite a long walk, I say. We can't take the suitcase. I need to take Wanda. We take Wanda. We walk along the overgrown railway tracks out to the edge of town. Ibi steps on every tie. The sun is behind us and we stop every so often to make our shadows into letters of the alphabet. And what sort of work experience can you bring to this job, young man? Well, sir, I spent one summer playing with Barbie dolls and practicing making my body into a K. Excellent. We've got exciting openings in that area. We follow the tracks as the sun rises high in the sky. Ivy walks along the rail holding my hand. My feet crunch on the sharp gravel and Ivy sings something about chicks. I inhale the dusty smell of sun-baked weeds and I'm pulled back to the summer when we used to come out here. Jeff and Danielle and I. That was the summer that Jeff was a double agent planning to blow up the enemy supply train. The sharp sound of a pneumatic drill rips through the air, and Ivy's hand tightens in mine. What's that? I remember. It's just a woodpecker. There was a woodpecker back then, too. Machine gun attack, yelled Jeff, and I forgot it was a game and threw myself down the bank into the bushes. Jeff laughed at me. No little ducks came swimming back. 
Ibe's high, thin voice is burrowing itself into my brain, and there is a pulse above my left eye. I begin to wish I had brought something to drink. Maybe it's time to go back. And then we come to the stream. I hear it before I see it. And then I remember what happened there. Ibe jumps off the track and dances off toward the water. I don't want to go there. Not that way, Ibe. Come on, Ken. I'm exploring. This is an exploration mission. You said. I follow her. It's different. The trees, dusty, scruffy-looking cottonwoods, have grown up, and the road appears too soon. But there it is. The stream takes a bend and disappears into a small culvert under the road. Vines grow across the entrance to the drainage pipe. I push them aside and look in. A black hole with a perfect circle of light at the end. It's so small. Had we really walked through it? Jeff and Danielle and finally me, terrified, shamed into it by a girl and a double dare. I take a deep breath and I'm there again. That smell. Wet and green and dangerous. There I was, feet braced against the pipe, halfway through the tunnel at the darkest part. I kept my mind up, up out of the water where Jeff said black water bloodsuckers lived. I kept my mind up until it went right into the weight of the earth above me. Tons of dirt and cars and trucks and being buried alive. Dirt pressing heavy against my chest, against my eyelids, against my legs which wouldn't move. Above the roaring in my ears, I heard a high snatch of song. Two notes with no words. Calling. I pushed against the concrete and screamed without a sound. And then Jeff yelled into the tunnel. What's the matter, Kenny? Is it the bloodsuckers? Kenton, Kenton, where are you? Vivant to suck your blood. Jeff had a way of saying Kenton that made it sound like an even finkier name than it is. By this time, I had peed my pants, and I had to pretend to slip and fall into the water to cover up. The shock of the cold, the end of the tunnel. Jeff pushed me into the stream because I was wet already. Danielle stared at me and she knew. Where does it go? Ivy pulls on my shirt. I'm big again, huge, like talking doll. It goes under the road. I walked through it once. Did you go to that other place? What other place? Ivy gives me the look. Where those other girls play. I think this goes there. Yeah, right. The Barbies visit the culvert. Ivy steps right into the tunnel. Come on, Kenton. I grab her. Hey, hold it. You can't go in there. You'll, you'll get your sandals wet. And I can't come. I don't fit. Ivy sits down on the gravel and takes off her sandals. I fit. Blackwater bloodsuckers. But why would I want to scare her? And hey, it's just a tunnel. So I happen to suffer from claustrophobia. That's my problem. Okay, but look, I'll wait on this side until you're halfway through, and then I'll cross the road and meet you on the other side. Are you sure you're not scared? Ivy steps into the pipe and stretches to become an X. Look, look how I fit. I watch the little X splash its way into the darkness. Okay, Ivy, see you on the other side. Last one there is a rotten egg. I let the curtain of vines fall across the opening. I pick up the sandals and climb the hill. It's different, too. It used to be just feathery horsetail, and now skinny trees grow there. I grab onto them to pull myself up. I cross the road, hovering on the center line as an RV rumbles by, and then I slide down the other side, following a small avalanche of pebbles. I kneel on the top of the pipe and stick my head in, upside down. Hey, rotten egg, I beat you. Small, echoing, dripping sounds are the only answer. I peer into the darkness. She's teasing me. I be. Ibe, 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 the tunnel throws my voice back at me. A semi-trailer roars by on the road. I jump down and stand at the pipe's entrance. My eyes adjust and I can see the dim green O at the other end. No outline of a little girl. A tight heaviness grips me around the chest. I B, answer me right now. I mean it. I drop the sandals. She must have turned and hidden on the other side just to fool me. I don't remember getting up the hill and across the road, except that the noise of a car horn rips across the top of my brain. She isn't there. Empty tunnel. Elizabeth! She slipped. She knocked her head. Child drowns in four inches of bath water. I have to go in. I try walking doubled over. But my feet just slip down the slimy curved concrete and I can only shuffle. I drop to my hands and knees. Crawl, 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 crawl. The sound of splashing fills my head. Come back, Elizabeth. Do not push out against the concrete. Just go forward. Splash, splash. Do not think up or down. Something floats against my hand. I gasp and jerk upwards, cracking my head. It's Wanda. I push her into my shirt. My knee bashes into a rock, and there is some sobbing in the echoing tunnel. It is my own voice. 
And then I grab the rough ends of the pipe and pull myself into the light and the bigness. Ivy is crouched at the edge of the stream, pushing a floating leaf with a stick. A green light makes its way through the trees above. She looks at me and sees Wanda poking out of my shirt. Oh, good, you found her. Bad Wanda, running away. My relief explodes into anger. Ivy, where were you? Playing with the girls. No, quit pretending. I'm not playing. Where were you when I called you from this end of the tunnel? Were you hiding? Didn't you hear me call? Sure I heard you, silly. That's how they knew my name. And I was going to come back, but it was my turn. They never let me play before, but this time they knew my name and I got to go into the circle. They were dancing, like ballerinas, except they had long hair. I get to have long hair when I'm in grade two. My head is buzzing. I must have hit it harder than I realized. I hand Wanda to Ivy and grab at some scents. Why didn't you come when I called you? They said I wasn't allowed to go, not while I was in the circle, and they were going to give me some cake. I saw it. It had sprinkles on it. And then you called me again, but you said Elizabeth. And then they made me go away. Ivy blows her leaf boat across the stream, and then she starts to sing. Idy, Idy, what's your name? What's your name to get in the game? The final puzzle piece of memory slides into place. That song, the two-note song, the sweet high voice calling me in the tunnel, the sound just before Jeff called me back by my real name. They wanted me. They wanted Ivy. I begin to shiver. I find myself sitting on the gravel. The stream splashes its way over the lip of the pipe into the tunnel. I stare at Ivy, who looks so small and solid. My wet jeans with their slime green knees begin to steam in the sun. A crow tells us a thing or two. Ken? Yes? I don't really like those girls. No, they don't sound that nice. Do you want to go home? Okay. I rinse off my hands and glance once more into the darkness. Put on your sandals then. Ivy holds on to the back belt loops of my jeans, and I pull her up the hill, into the sunshine.